Yeah, Phil for Kevy. Watching him at that press conference, he was broken. I feel mm. really sorry for him. The next morning I got up and I said, listen, I don't know, I didn't count who was in the room, I didn't look, I don't, I don't care, but who was in that room, you beat yourselves out to Penrith Park this afternoon, punch the bags and, you know, have a bit of a sweat out before we train in the morning, you know. So I drove past Penrith Park that night and every car was in the car. <laughs> park, so. They're lining up on the one defender and this is always the option to kick. What happens with the BK is, of course, you've got two blokes, the outside defence have to come up and they have to come forward. This is the maddest place on the planet. <laughs> Dancing. The only show where you're allowed to do it without shoes on. Andrew Johns, one of the greatest players of all time. Cuddles and kisses go a long way, especially when you're in trouble. Oh, the horse has bolted. Look at the big fellow go in. Imagine if he wanted to fire. <laughs> They're very what? horny and very aggressive. Are we allowed to put that to air? Sydney, stay classy. I love everyone for making me feel this good. Welcome to a bumper grand final episode of Freddie and the Eighth, brought to you by the Tab. And if you want to be part of the VIP Melbourne Cup experience, head to the website below and enter the draw. Coming up, it might be a grand final week, but the Broncos have certainly made some waves off the field. We'll bring you our season highlights for 2024. And we continue our tradition of big name guests in grand final week. Maybe this one's bigger than last year, which was Peter Overton, by the way. Brad Fittler, hello. How are you, Matt? Great to see you. You too. Where the eighth. I think he's uh, checking the weather. Is he? I think so. Well, he was such a big hit with his weather forecast for Grand Final Week. On last year's Grand Final show, here's Andrew Johns with the Grand Final Week weather. And the outlook for Grand Final Week is mostly fine. Have a look at that. Thursday, 21 degrees, a low of 11. Friday, 24, a low of 8. Saturday, 28 degrees, low of 12, and maybe a chance of a couple of showers. But have a look at Sunday, our biggest day of the year. 29 degrees, but getting down to around 12 degrees by kickoff. So men, maybe take a cardigan, women, maybe a petticoat. Uh, and there it is throughout the day. Look at it. Climb to 28 by 5 pm, and then gradually going down to 22 by 8 pm. So just remember. Monday's a public holiday, so ladies and gents, whatever you're going to do, do it well and do it large. Well done. Well done, Ezra Johns. Here is a man that takes his weather very seriously. And he thought, and he thought I think this could be a career for you following commentary. Yep. You and Peter Overton? Yep, me and Pete, just locking horns on TV and late at night. I don't think he's that kind of guy. No. Yeah, neither do I. <laughs> the one thing I thought about, though, Dropping down to 12 degrees will be pretty dewy. Mm. Yeah, long sprigs. Long sprigs. Take your long studs. I reckon Brad. every time a player slips over, there should be some sort of sponsorship and some sort of punishment. Fine. Family of League. Got to donate to the Family of League. That yeah. should be the punishment. What, 50 bucks? Or the Mark Hughes Foundation. Or the Mark Hughes Foundation. Yeah. Either or. Uh, massive day, of course, grand final day. 10 o'clock, we're out there. Starting off with Sports Sunday, then the Sunday footy show. We've got... State Championship action. Then we've got NRLW Grand Final. The Roosters have won the comp before. The Sharkies in their first ever Grand Final. The news at six, and then we're back out there with all the lead into Penrith versus Melbourne. It's a special day. No matter Shame how. Shame it's not a sprint. Yes, yes. Maybe you have to work on that how one for next happen? year. I saw Loffy Camperero. I didn't actually ask him. You've been out mingling with some of the Prime Minister's team today. That's right. Hey, a, has the team been officially announced? I'm not sure, so I don't, I don't want to announce it, but I've got to say, I was very excited in there. Some of the absolute young guns of our Come game. Well, give us a couple of names. Well, I gave you one there. Carl Pereira. Carl Pereira. Um, the other winger, Canberra Raider. I actually asked him what the quickest time he'd ever run. Xavier Savage. 10-5. Whoa. Mate, that's lightning. So there's some real speedsters, but... Um, yeah, great team. Great young team. Can't wait. Fantastic. International footy uh, following uh, Grand Final Day. You're the week after, aren't you? The Prime Minister's third. Yeah. Up. Does Albo come to training or anything? Albo, he was part of the selection. How many South players? Many South he spots. kicks off. He kicks off at training. He does, does he? dropouts. <laughs> it's like John Howard bowling. Oh. <laughs> Hit his big toe. Yes. Uh, great memories, I'm sure, for you two. Grand Final week. Mm. It's a long week. It feels like a really long week. Yep, 
part of it is handling the week. Mm. There's a lot on, a lot on. And if you're out of town, you've got to come for the grand final breakfasts and there's all sorts of stuff. Well, not anymore, thankfully. No? No, no breakfast anymore. Oh, it's not happened? It hasn't happened for quite a while. I could imagine, as great as it is being part of... Do Melbourne that, have to come at all? Do they have to come up to the... Is there an activation on Thursday? I, I, think, there would, I think there's something. I mean, there's always that pre-game media fan sort of thing, if that's, <laughs> if that's an accurate description. But yeah. the grand final breakfast would have been hard, I reckon. Like, early, early morning. Punishing. Yeah? yeah? Punishing. Punishing. Mm. We might talk about a grand final, famous grand final breakfast of yesteryear with uh, our guest coming up. What a tackle. Mm. Oh. Gee, we forget about that one. In Jeez, the... They brush that one quick, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Sats, Sats completely gazumped you. There's Joe Batanza. Who do you it's hard to tackle? Mal or Todd Boom? <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> yeah. Mallows. <laughs> how good. Oh, how good is that window comp? I saw a clip the other day of our, uh, I think it was 95 tour in Mallows. Was Mullows there? Mm. Or was it a strange no, tour with Mullows? 94. 94. Go, 95. Hey, we're going to preview the game, but just as a, a top-line thought, this is going to be really close, isn't it? Mm. Really close. Definitely. I definitely think you know, Nelson has brought them closer. I think Melbourne have been so dominant all year. They've won every big game. Like, Cronulla got them down there, St George got them down there. You know, maybe caught them off guard a bit, but every other big game this year they've won. Mm. So the big news this week outside of grand final talk has been Michael Maguire taking over as Brisbane Broncos coach. It was a bit of a thunderbolt, wasn't it, out of, out of the blue for people yeah. that aren't in the inner, inner sanctum uh, last week when Kevin Walters was shown the door by the club. I suppose on the basis of results, it shouldn't be that big a surprise, but clearly there was something happening in the background that Kevy went Friday and Madge has appointed yeah, over the weekend. weeks before, without doubt. It was done. Yeah, Phil for Kevy. Watching him at that press conference, he was broken. I mm. felt really sorry for him. Considering last year he was 20 minutes off a grand final. Brisbane haven't won a grand final in 18 years. Mm -hmm. Is that right? For a club that big, it, uh, that's really surprising. 06. Yeah, I feel for Kevy. Do you reckon the way the season ended kind of signed the death warrant a little bit? Well, like they I ended badly. Mate, the way it ended, but I think it's all about the review. Everyone keeps talking about the review. So the Broncos, obviously, officials put out a review. Thoughts on the season, thoughts on where they're going, thoughts on culture, thoughts on whatever, professionalism, whatever it was. And the mail is that didn't come out very good. But the review seems to have happened after the decision was already made, it would appear. You can't appoint a coach in the space of a week, can you? Like, it takes a bit longer than that. Do you think the review was done to protect... Some people, so they didn't look like the bad guys. Hmm. But on the basis of results, the decision was not unexpected, particularly when you consider going into next year, if they start poorly, the heat's going to be right on there from the start. Shouldn't be on Madge. If they start poorly, then it's, no, on, it's if on they the... Kept, if they kept I'm Kevin Walton. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but it's on the players. Yeah. Players are never accountable. I think from the club's point of view, it's the right way to move. Like if you're going to change coach and if you think about changing coach, it's going to come out in the way, mm. the way you, you know, the way you do things. There's always going to be that in the background. So, um, yeah, it's, it's now a match. But I think given what they did last year, it's having the bad year this year, I think. Obviously, that's hurt everyone. You know, it's mm. hurt all their coaching staff and I know a lot of the staff are all sort of nervous about having a job next year. Mm. Madge will obviously come in and... There's no way in the world he's just going to sit there and go, well, I'm happy to have your staff. Mm, There's right. a good chance he'll come through and make changes. So, Well, uh, Trent Barrett linked up with the club. Mm. Um, Cardi's gone to the UK. So, that so was is Cardi head coach over in the UK? I believe so, yes. Ben Teo was another one. Ben Teo was another one. Did, uh, did Madge coach Ben Teo at set? Did, was he playing? Yeah, he was, yeah, was in the grand final yeah. team. Was he? Pretty sure. Well, Reynolds and he link up again. Who's the other Queenslander in the? Who was the other Queenslander in that team? Chris McQueen. Chris McQueen. Oh. There was one more. Oh, Dave Taylor. It was a winger. Kirisom Avaa. No, winger. Lottie Takiri. Lottie Takiri. It was Lottie. He was a winger for South. Well, that's a trivia question. Um, I think he'll do a good job. He's got 
the problem I see, the problem I see about Brisbane from the outside looking in is they haven't got one or two senior hardheads to grab well, the. Carrigan, look. Yeah, but mate, he's early to mid twenties. I'm talking about. I oh, know, but he needs. Well, he needs to. He needs to be that person. Of course. Do you reckon he'll, take, he'll be captain next year? Do you reckon they take the captaincy away from Reynolds? I mean, he's only because they haven't been able to keep him on the field. Well, if Reynolds can stay on the field, he'll mm. stay here, but. Well, I'm assuming they've got a pretty good relationship, Reynolds and Maguire from South yeah. Sydney. Yeah. yeah. So I'm assuming that, you know, I don't know if that's your problem, him being captain or whatever you're doing going forward, but it, you're right. You just need some of those younger blokes. Yeah. They've got to stand up. They, locked, they lost Kirk Capewell. It was yeah. sure he played that role. Flegler, someone I always saw as. I don't know what he's like off the field and stuff, but he, he's, he's a hard man. He's a man. He looks like a tough bloke, yeah. doesn't he? And he, like, he left. You know, Payne had a, he's had a tough couple of years yeah. dealing with all sorts of things. Yeah. So, mm. But they've got to keep Reynolds on the field. They keep Reynolds on the field, say, 80%, 90% of the time, then they're top 14. It'd be interesting, the review of the medical system, because they send our players out everywhere. This is another interesting element. Free agents from November 1 this year. Well, Blake Moser, they got massive wraps on him as a young dummy half. Mm. Massive, massive wraps. Um, Selwyn will be interesting. Selwyn will be interesting. Mm. Katoni. Because you're going to, like, you think Katoni and Selwyn could get big money elsewhere. Can you keep both of them? I notice as well, Michael Maguire has said that Kobe Hetherington is a player of interest to him. And he had been given permission to negotiate elsewhere. So I like him as a player. Stay. He's the sort of player you need in your team. Mm. Tough, hard-working, gets through all the hard work. Well, he's in the Prime Minister's team. Oh, is he? I was that excited. I'm a fan. Like, I, he's tough, mm. but then also has skill. That's Jason's son. Jason. Yeah. No, is it son or nephew? I thought it was well, nephew. It's his son, is it? I thought it's his son. Does he talk like I don't know. Dalton? He wasn't there today. But anyway, I'm a fan too. Oh, he's, he's tough. Fine. He's got that hard edge about him. Mm. I'm um, aware of the sensitivity around this with respect to you, Brad, but the coaching situation at New South Wales, this is far from ideal, isn't it, Joey? To have a coach come in, did a great job, won the yeah. series, but the way the thing is set up now, it's not so much a full-time commitment, so it's going to be hard to keep people in that job. Well, at the moment, there's two players, ex-players, that stand out for me. I, look, being an origin coach, you've got to have presence in the dressing room. And I think back the last 20, 25 years... Gus, Ricky Stewart, Laurie Daly, Freddie, Madge. They all had presence in the dressing room. So for me, you've got to be looking at a coach who's got that presence. And there's two, and they're ex-players for me. Trent Barrett is one. Uh, and the other one's Denny Badiris. Denny was on uh, your staff for yeah. four years. Is he interested in coaching again? I don't know. I haven't really spoken to him about it. He'd be him. sensational. But once again, either Baz or Danny Vadiris. But then well, you, get the, would, would you get the right people around him. So when Laurie actually got the job, it was me, Trent Barrett and Laurie, because they end up going from... It was of course Sturlow asked me on the footy show. Because when Ricky Stewart, they said, oh, he's not going to do it anymore. Sturlow asked me on the footy show and said, would you do it? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. And so that ended up sending... It was going to be Laurie all the time. Mm. But it sent it into a sort of scenario, I think, where they wanted to be, you know respectful, mm. and so it was me, um, Trent and Laurie. So I think, yeah, I think Trent would do a great job. Yeah, if, if Betsy, for whatever reason, doesn't want to do it, I'd be putting all my cards on. Are you, like, are you aware of... Betsy, Coach, are you aware of Betsy's in intentions? Newcastle. Beg your pardon? Are you aware of whether Betsy would be interested? Well, I haven't I haven't spoke to him. What, what's he's your inclination? Staying my, well, he's staying at my joint Saturday night. I might... Get a few into him. I'll get the exclusive... You'll hear but what, what it someday. Do you think? Just... What do you think? Do you think he would be? As I said, I don't know. Do. I really don't know. I don't know. What, what do you reckon? Really Mary, of course. Mary was with me last year. Oh, yeah, Mary. We saw Brad Arthur there, but he's taken a job in the UK. Um, I, I did the podcast with Gary. Sorry, he, I left Mary. He was very strong saying that if this job is to stay in the current format, i.e. a shorter-term role... There is no reason that a club coach shouldn't take shouldn't be available to take on the job and the New South Wales Rugby League should alter their policy. If Penrith win on Sunday, Ivan Cleary's won four premierships in a row. Surely the club would be prepared to let him go and coach the origin in addition to Penrith. Do you think it's too big a job? Well, you know what? I mean, to be a coach, like anyone could turn up and do it. Mm. 
but, but there's all stuff you've got to do around it. You know, there's confidentiality. And you're talking to other clubs and you're getting information about players and the club's going to give information about players and their injuries. And there's all sorts of things that goes on behind the scenes these days. In the old days, Gus, you know, he'd drive from Penrith, go down, coach, and then drive back to Penrith and go back to doing that job. And he had players in his team from the other team, like Trevor Gilmeister and But can't, so you, put, can't you put a system around... So, Let's say Cleary, for example. Can't there be a system put around him where that work can Mate, be done? Anyone for him? could go and coach. Well, there's, that's not the hard part. The coaching for the week's not the hard part. It's all the other stuff and getting the detail and giving you due diligence. It's most what's mm. show now. Like it's yeah, of course. It's not just something you just smash together over a couple of days. No, but is there is there not a way that you could put a team around an incumbent NRL coach that does a lot of I, that I think groundwork? It's, I think it's too big a job. Who's going to do I, all I the free stuff? Ivan's going to get you know, like we talk about Origin week two. Week two of the competition, we're talking about origin. And normally when I was coach, you're out there sort of explaining about what you're doing and how it's going. So how's Ivan going to be doing that, talking about being the Blues coach? You know, we're talking a month out or two months out from the game. OK. I think, so, it, get, I think it gets very murky. And I don't know if the clubs would appreciate it. But he's very capable hmm. of being able to turn up, coach an origin team for a week and then be at their best. He could do that easy. That's not a problem. What about a ticket like, and let's, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, Bedsy, let's say Danny Badiris and Ivan Clear as assistant coach. Would that work? Ivan as assistant? We'll have, have a current NRL coach well, providing that. Well, just sit in the box at yeah. one time. Well, Ivan was going to be part of the, the group that I had to staff this year or last year, the year just gone by. So okay. Ivan, Ivan was going to be part of that. What about just Ivan? On, just on game day. He was going to do just, like Ivan's, you know, he could turn up just on game day and coach. What about yeah. Ivan as like a brandy role, an advisor? He'd be good at yeah. that. Yeah. I think, it's too big, I think it's too big for a club coach. I think it's too murky from what you've got to do. You've got to talk about a lot leading into it. And obviously Channel 9 mm -hmm. are pushing that a lot, given it's our product. Mm. So all of a sudden you're concentrating on Penrith. Don't know. I love how the contenders are thrown up in a lot of the press. They just throw every, every name possible, including yourself and your brother. Me? Yeah. <laughs> No chance. I vaguely remember you almost saying you'd do it after a, one of your impassioned outbursts after an Origin decider. I thought he was trying to lay it <laughs> on the bullets. Not a chance in the world. Could you well, imagine that? The reality TV show. Head case does his head in. I'd love to watch you during the... The, the, no. the interview during the game would be good. Oh, He'd be in the fetal yuck. position. I'm getting anxiety. Day, <laughs> day for a camp would be better. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You could do the day easy. You could do the coaching. You'd love the coaching, like yeah, the box. It's just all the, the bullshit that goes with it. Andrew at a press conference <sighs> in front of a bunch of Queensland journos. Uh, Penrith's fifth trip to the grand final in a row. It's a pretty amazing record, isn't it? But there's been some great pictures come out of Leagues Clubs in grand final week over the years. Here's some from Penrith. The full time siren ended a grand final and kicked off a party. The players were paraded before their adoring fans. That man, Roy Simmons, still the centre of attention. Greg Alexander was also popular. Leaving the club at dawn, the players headed to a local tavern where last year they'd drowned their sorrows after losing to Canberra. Giving away nearly 10 years to his teammates, Royce wasn't showing signs of wearying. Next season couldn't be further from a Panthers mind. Still going late this morning and dressed up in rap gear, they were nursing hangovers, a new baby and celebrating the birth of a new era. points to eight. A big win for the Roosters over the Warriors in 2002. Unfortunately for Nelson, he's not going to be there this year. Mm. It's a big big call to rub a player out of a grand final. They got the grading wrong. There's no way that was grade three. I don't think they got the grading right but I'm happy the fact he doesn't play. From a point of view of, I understand what they go through at the headquarters and what they're looking for and to be fair well you've got to be fair. You can't just turn up and go Right, it's a grand final. A bloke can do whatever he wants the week before. Well, you imagine what happens then. But if it's one week, 
I think that, like Cameron Smith got rubbed out for one week. Isaac Luke was the same. Mm -hmm. Defer it, like they're doing races, one week. And then... You so can Nelson got four weeks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 I, yeah I think the, gra you. the grading yeah. was Defer right. Defer it? Well, they do it in the, in the horse racing. Yeah, Why couldn't they just... not a team sport. Well, so if a bloke gets one week, you're going to... Ch they... <laughs> you talk to Cameron Smith, he's, he's still shattered by it. Rick Alley was another one, did yeah, he miss 2004. it? 2004. Mm. Hey, what, for, what, for sticking up for his mate from punching someone? It's ridiculous. Mm. For the rest of your life, you've got to live with not playing a grand final because you've got one week suspension. And have a look at Cameron. They got beat 40 nil because mm. he didn't play. It's, what, are they, what are they called in races, uh, in the racing world? They um, a stay of proceedings stay or, stay or, something? or something? like that, yeah. Here's another good trivia question. Who played hooker in that grand final with Cameron Smith suspended? Cameron McInnes. Happy Chorus there. No, for Melbourne. The, when Cameron oh. Smith was suspended. Luke, no, not Luke Swain. He was before that. Uh, that was Richard Swain. Richard Swain. Russell Aitken. Oh, wow. 40 nil. Um, yes. Gee. Oh, of course, Billy, Billy was suspended. Well, provisionally sus well, cited anyway. Wasn't he charged with that shoulder charge and got off? At the judiciary mm. that year. No, there's no one, no one should, grand final no week. one should miss a grand final for Jeez, a one week harsh, suspension. What are these here? Mm. Wow. Back in the archives. Speaking of which, season highlights. I'm going to go first. Origin decider. It's so hard to go past an origin decider at the best of times, but when it's a game of this quality, my goodness. You know what? There's never been a game where I've felt the physicality like that game, being yeah. on the sideline. That was right in front of us, that little melee. Mm. But there would have been 30 tackles in that game, which actually shook the stadium. What a game. And we didn't get a try for over an hour, Joey, and no one cared. No. It was just awesome. No. No one cared. No one. It was... It, I don't know how far they can push the limits. That, that's as hard... And as intense they can go, I, I don't think the human body can cop anymore. Well, mate, you had Tino and Flegler, mm. and straight away you you turn it up again. That was uh, yeah, that's something like I've never seen before. Mm. I had friends from um, from England text me, said, "What is that game?" Mm. I said, "What is that?" I said, "I was just watching it with my mouth open, just how hard, physical, intense." I remember there was a moment on the sideline where Val Holmes jumped on a ball, loose ball. And like we were literally five metres away. And the intensity, I think it was Croydon, about three of them came in on the tackle. Mm. Like it was <laughs> just launching full, full pelt, as hard as they could. And we're just sitting, I'm just sitting there just going, oh. Mm. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was as physical as I've ever seen a game. Absolutely stunning. I went to the Olympics about four days after that too. <laughs> it's yeah, like, wow. Uh, Vegas, for those of us that were allowed to go. This was... Oh, <laughs> JT, what about your moves, bro? You need wings, brother. Body slide on the dance floor. Um, he practised you know with a mad cow. I've never seen our fans so excited. Yeah, right. Walking around the streets of Las Vegas when they did that, uh, the fan activation... I don't think I've ever seen our fans so excited and so proud of our game. Like, it was, they were in such a great mood. One of the real good things will be is the English game. Warrington and was, Wigan. I couldn't believe how many English fans were there. Yes. There were heaps of English fans there as well. Right. So, a lot, yeah, it was... It and was, we've got an NRLW... An NRLW. Test. No, no, the Lionesses are playing the... Kangaroos. Is, the, the, not the Kangaroos. Kangaroos. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But the English, when they're playing, when Wigan and Warrington, they sing. Yeah. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the atmosphere, and the Aussies will get on board and start It's all singing. played on one night, isn't it? Uh, I, I thought it might have been two, but I, I haven't looked. You know what? Admit. So did I, but then someone told me one night. I thought that's... Five a, games? It's disappointing. But, um, four games? Sorry, four games. Yeah, Which, it was uh, awesome. Jilla be first, awesome. and then the English game. Well, oh, it's four games in one day. Yes, you're right. Jeez. It is. That's... Uh, mate, the size of those cans of beer that they serve, and you, you miss. <laughs> if you get on the drink for the start, you're not seeing much at the end. It was a good time. It was yeah. a good, exact, great time. 
great time. And like I said, mate, the fans were excellent. You got to go. I don't want to go. Let's leave it. You'd at like it. it. I know it would. It's too much fun. That's why I don't want to go. Um, what was your <laughs> moment of the year? Mine was Bradman best try. It was just that game was in the balance, and this one here, finally an offload, and then a bit of broken field play. And then Jerome got in the clear. This is a great pass. Oh, Bradman, Bradman a beats Gagai and then beats Halen Ponga. Two nights. And, mate, that, that, that there, I think, is probably, at origin level, without doubt, the most excited I've ever been watching a try. Mm. It's just... And, you know, they had the camera on me. I didn't even know. But you can see the anxiety. Yeah. Just, oh, that game was just... It's out of this game. world. And that try from Bradman, it was, it was just... Game. And being a Newcastle boy, mm -hmm. it was pretty special. You know what, to back it up, we saw the try before Mitchell. Mitchell Moses. Yeah. See, that was How good a Bradman. try was that? Oh, it's the best. What a performance. What a moment Moses. for him. Mm. Games two and three. We've had some high-profile guests here on Friday in the eighth. Ryan Pappenhausen, Peter Rovenden, Taylor Swift. Did Maybe we? after the break, <laughs> doesn't get any bigger than this. For the last five years, Phil Gould has probably walked hundreds of kilometres across Penrith Park. Today he took his final stroll and spoke of his desire for a change. The last couple of years has just taken its toll and I think it's time now for, uh, for someone new to come in with more enthusiasm. While there's been speculation for weeks that Gould was headed for East, he maintains it was just a matter of good timing. My mind had been made up that this was going to be my last year at Penrith. And as soon as I was convinced of that, um, I, I let them know because I didn't want them uh, in any doubt as to the future of the club. Um, the eastern suburbs thing has, has just come at the right time. Gould has signed for three years with a two-year option. His wage said to be around $200,000 a year. Gould is happy he's left Penrith as a competitive club. As for the Roosters, it's a fresh start. Gould not only their star coach, but a magnet to attract top-line players. And the feelers are already out. There's been some phone calls come through from some fairly prominent first graders in other clubs that, uh, that may be available for next year. It's been a remarkable season for coaches. Bob McCarthy, Mark Murray, Warren Ryan and now Gould, all gone before their contracts were up. Gould's the only one with a new job and the pressure's on. I think um, that we'll give the semis a shake next year as early as next year. Well, the great news is he hasn't changed a bit <laughs> since 1995. Phil Gould, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this madhouse. It was like looking in the mirror. Welcome. I'll tell you what it was like. It was like looking at your son. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell the story about when you... You know how long ago that was? That's oh, 94. 30 95 years ago. 95? 30 years ago. <laughs> 94. So what, didn't you just buy a new car and you uh, went down to see Nick Politis and he <laughs> confiscated it or something? I just bought a brand new Holden Statesman from the sponsor at Penrith. And the only reason I bought it was because Holden were running a... Uh, uh, promotion, you get a new set of Cobra golf clubs, a new set of Greg Norman Cobra golf clubs. So I brought the Statesman car to get the new golf club. <laughs> and uh, the next day I drove down to meet Nick Politis at City Ford and drove home in a Ford. <laughs> he took what, what was in the glove box when Nick gave you the car? <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? What was the first meeting like with Nick? It was, well, I actually knocked the job back. I, the Roosters rang me and I knocked the job back twice and said no. And I hadn't met Nick at that stage. And then in the end, Nick ran and said, can you come down and see me? I said, yeah. So I drove down to City Ford and we went round to Stanley Street there, you know, in Surrey Hills and <laughs> had a meal at his favourite restaurant and halfway through it, I shook his hand and that was it. I don't think I ever signed a contract with the Roosters. Everything was a handshake with Nick, so, yeah. Difference coaching Penrith to the Roosters? Ah, oh, different planets, different planets. It was, it was interesting. I mean, Penrith was a young club and we had a, a lot of young kids come through the system out there. And Roosters, when I got there, was a bit of a transit lounge. They really didn't have development processes and uh, they were a club that went out and spent money on established players. And um, even back then, we, I said to Nick, you know, you need to have your own development programs. And, uh, but we turned it around pretty quickly. Brad came the next year in 96 and uh, we went to the top four in 96 within 18 months. And after that, uh, uh, they've virtually been there ever since. So important. Isn't it? I think one of the other things still is Ivan Cleary, Jack Ellsgood, Matt Singh. Mm. Um, you know, you can just tell blokes who just love footy. Yeah. You know, been at clubs who, you know, really footy oriented. Roosters was very different yeah. early on. We tried, we tried to buy on personality and character and we tried to buy younger fellas that would have been in successful sort of 
clubs. Uh, and I mean, you were a big part of it. You were a big attraction. You know, to have Brad Fittler come to the club, particularly at that stage, of your career was enormous. And uh, um, since then, uh, they've been able to develop their own. People talk about the Roosters buying a lot of players, and they still do. But it's because they do spend a lot of time developing talent. And every time they've won a premiership, 12 or 13 of the team that play on the day came to them as teenagers. Mm. And I think that's how you build the DNA of your club. And the Roosters have maintained their DNA over a long period of time. And if you look at the Storm and the Panthers and the Roosters, who've dominated virtually for the last decade, they've also been the three best development clubs in the league. And, and they're really stuck by it. Geez, these are old visions, isn't it? Yeah, good. What about you? You've been involved with rugby league pretty much your whole life. Player? Coach, now administrator, what's been your favourite time? And commentator. Commentator, but at Clubland, player, coach, administrator, what's, his, what's been your favourite role? I think we're all players, Andrew. Mm. I think you, you morph into the other roles. I mean, players, everyone wants to play. If I could be 24 again for an hour, I'd want to play. I think that's what we all are. We're all players. You get too old to play and you think you've got knowledge, so you coach, and then you get too old to coach, so you end up with a job <laughs> in administration or media if you're lucky enough. Uh, otherwise, you've got to go and find a real job. Um, I've never had a real job. I've been in football all my life. It's been a blessing. Why not the NRL? Why not go to um, the governing body? Because there's a photo you're on pretty, the door he's not allowed in. You're pretty vocal <laughs> about things that happen in the game, and you know I think you've got a, as good an idea of what's going on in rugby league as anyone as I've ever met. Why not? The NRL? Uh, I think a lot of that was probably sort of squashed back in the Super League days, I think back in those times and, uh, and what happened in the game those days. I've, I've always felt that I could have more influence on the game in the roles that I've had rather than being at head office. Um, um, I'm not saying that that's not a possibility sometime in the future, but it's never really come up and it's never really been an option. And I've felt that whatever influence I can have in the game or whatever I can give to the game, I can do more in club land, um, which is all representative football or, you know, in administrative roles or what have you. So it's been a blessing. It's been wonderful to be in the game. This is my 49th year. It's incredible. Really? We better get your cake for the start of next season, yeah. 50 years. So you talk about how tough Malcolm really was when he coached you. Who's scarier to cop a bake from, Malcolm really or Gus? Both bad. Does Malcolm give you bakes? Not really. He more just finished look at you. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best serve you got from Gus? He was a hard man. Oh. <laughs> There's a couple. They want to could you was good. <laughs> <laughs> the newspaper just happened to be there. Oh, yeah. The newspaper just happened yeah, to be there. Yeah, and it was, it was poorly reported at the time because it, it actually ended up all right. But, um, oh, yeah. I mean, and that's part of coaching and part of leadership sometimes. And, you know. It's part of man management, isn't it? Yeah. You gave yeah. me a bake. Mm. Yeah. Knowing that I'd go away, I wasn't playing well. Knowing I'd go away and pick my act up and oh. start ripping into training. You look like you're an oasis. So there's two parts to that. I think obviously there's the uh, you know understanding people that he need to bake, and I think all the key players throughout their career under you most surely need to bake at some stage, and you pick that good. The other part is actually being able to deliver it. Mm. Now, what about like the other parts of your life? You went to uni at one stage, like coming through as a, a young bloke, playing footy, going to uni. Like, what was that like? Well, the game wasn't really set up for it in those days. I mean, when I started, I was playing under 23s at 18 years of age. I played, I, had, I got a game in first grade that year, and I was going to University of New South Wales at Randwick, playing football at Penrith. And there's no freeways in those days, and I'm working three nights a week at Rydex Servicemen's Club um, behind the bar to pay for money to have spending money. So. I'm doing a thousand miles a week and something had to give. By the third year, I'm the captain of the first grade side. Something had to give and it wasn't going to be the football. <laughs> it had to be the education. So I stopped the uni degree and, and stuck into football. I ended up working at Penrith Leeds Club as a trainee manager there for a couple of years until um, I was recruited to go to the Newdown Jets in 1981, which was extraordinary because I met a coach called Warren Ryan and uh, a lot of great men. It kind of went from being a boy to a man, you know, a kid from the western suburbs and suddenly you're playing with an inner city team like the Newdown Jets and a lot of great people, a lot of great players. And uh, from there was recruited to the Bulldogs. Extraordinary, you know, I walked into the, full, the Bulldogs for the first day and it was so hard and it was so mentally breaking. I walked out and I rang my dad. I said, I'm never going back. I said, I, I don't want First wanna... day? First day. It was just so hard. What was hard? Like the, the physicality? Everything. The training, the whole thing. And, and it was, it's a hard place. Like it was just different. I was a Western Suburbs kid and I'm going into this inner city area here mm. in Belmore and it was just different and I thought, you know, um, it's going to be hard. 
and I, I tell this story to a lot of players because they feel the same way the first time they get there. But I tell the story, I walked in that first day and never wanted to come back again. Five years later, I was the head coach <laughs> and we won a comp. It's, a, it's like, a club that'll make you, you or break you. You were 28 then? I was 28. I retired at 28, so I was 29 when... Uh, and you coached. That's incredible. So you coached blokes you played with? I coached reserve grade there. So I had my last year at South in 1986 and then I went back to the Bulldogs and coached the reserve grade in 87 and then they made me first grade coach in 88. Now, it's grand final week. The 81 grand final, we saw a little bit of vision of it before. What did grand final week look like back in 1981? But you'd all have been, just go to work and turn up the training? Yeah, we, all, how it looked? we all had jobs. Yeah. We all had jobs. So we worked, you know, jobs, whatever we were doing. Some worked on councils. I worked on delivery trucks and huh. I had four or five different jobs. I worked at the race course. I worked for bookmakers, you know, I, whatever could sort of give you some spending money in between training sessions. And, um, spending money or punting money? <laughs> yeah, a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and, but grand final week, like back in those days, we trained Tuesday, Thursday night, Saturday morning, played on Sundays. That was your routine every week. There was no Thursday night, Friday night football, Saturday afternoon football. Like it was, you, you train Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday morning, you know, and then play on Sunday. And you go back to work on Monday and that's the way. You, and you train in the evening, you train at six o'clock at night. Um, you know, blokes used to roll up to training at Henson Park and sleep in their car for an hour before training started. You know, that's incredible, isn't it? They've been up early. And so, but th there's a lot of events around Grand Final Week and that's all part of the market. There was there anything back then? No. No? no. Nothing? Team photo. Would, Team you just, would you drive to the game? Would yeah. you just go to the game when yeah, you... Yeah, well, Dad, at that time, Dad was uh, running the sergeant's course at the Police Academy at Redfern. So we all met at the Police Academy at Redfern and got a bus to the ground. Oh. All right, and the reason why we did that was because... There was only limited tackers to get in. All the tickets were sold out. You couldn't get into the member stand. Dad knew the bloke on the gate. So we just kept taking busloads of people. Like, <laughs> he kept letting us in the member stand. They said the crowd was 59,000. It was about 80,000 there because we just filled up the member stand with all these people. But, there, yeah, there was, no, there was no camps. There was no, no, it was very, very different. Very, very different. Mid-90s, the Super League War. You were uh, behind the ARL. Probably without you and Bob Fulton, they wouldn't have survived the ARL. How much did that take out of you? Extraordinary time. I mean, it was... Um, uh, I think these days it's like a case study in uh, university for things like trade practices and, and different things. Um, extraordinary time in the game. But I was coaching the Roosters. I'd just gone to the Roosters and we were trying to survive as a team because every team was under pressure to survive and, and stay in whatever competition was going to go forward. Plus, um, I was sort of seconded into supporting... Bob Fulton was the Australian coach and I was a New South Wales coach at the time. And the game wanted to defend itself um, against, uh, against takeover and we did, and we did very successfully. Uh, it ended up in a split competition in 1997, which was bad for the game. It eventually came back together. But by the time I got to 99, um, I remember I went for a game of golf with Terry Hills with Brad Fittler. At the end of the round, I pulled you up in the car park and I said, I've had enough, I need, I need a break. Um, and it sort of, it wore me out. More the off-field stuff wore me out than the on-field stuff. But uh, we'd had four really good years mm. at the, five really good years at the Roosters. But, um, mm. yeah, it just got a bit hard. And I always thought I'd go back to it. I always, you know, I retired at the end of 99. Um, and we had a, a very successful period there. And I always thought I would go back and coach. I always thought, well, I'll just have a couple of years off and go back. And I didn't. I sort of started working in the media. And then the Roosters asked me to come back. And I said, no, but... They made me a coaching director and we brought Ricky Stewart. We had a, yeah. a coaching staff of Ricky Stewart, Dean Pay, John Cartwright, Ivan Cleary, Shane Flanagan. <laughs> that was our coaching staff. And I was the director of coaching. And we went to three grand finals mm -hmm. in a row, won a, won a comp and uh, won some lower grade comps there as well. And then I gave that away again. And I kept thinking, well, I'll go back to coaching one day. And it just never happened. I sort of went into the administrative role at Panthers and then now what I'm doing now. So the Penrith club, highly professional, obviously, in their fifth grand final. But the first time Penrith played in a grand final back in 1990 when you were coach and you were chief scallywag, this story is well told. But can I get the coach and the player's perspective of what happened when the Penrith boys went to town for the grand final breakfast? Yeah. I'll let the player talk first. Yeah. Well, it was a bit overwhelming. We didn't used to go into town that often. <laughs> the moment we went... Got off the Great Western Highway, things changed. Right. And, uh, yeah, so we, what was the next morning? The grand final breakfast. And we just got a bit excited, so we had some beers in... On the bus? No, in the one of the bedrooms. It was my bedroom, actually. Oh, it was yours? Yeah. 
And Cole Bentley at the time, it was very straight. He, you know, I think he actually left. <laughs> and it was funny because I used to forge signatures in the day. And then uh, I forged Cole Bentley's signature and on all the food and drink. <laughs> Don Felder <laughs> called me in the following day and said, oh, Cole Bentley seemed to have <laughs> racked up a pretty big bill. <laughs> and how I'm not big sure was, if it's Cole Bentley. How Bradley. big was that bill? Oh, it was thousands. <laughs> we had a great night. But, uh, and Gus actually walked in. Yeah. Horrifying. So did you hear a ruckus coming from one of the rooms? Well, what had happened was we had the grand final breakfast on the Friday morning. So I thought, and the, the breakfast was on at like 7 a.m. We'd have to get up at 4 a.m. in Penrith and get on a bus and go in. So I got the club to pay for a night out at the region hotel where it was. And it was pretty <laughs> plush for some kids from the Golden West. So we went out to dinner together. I used to take them for no names for a spaghetti. We got a no names for a spaghetti. And I've met my girl in town and gone to the movies. So I said, I'll see you all in the morning. So I've gone and met my girl and I've come home at like 11.30 at night. And I can, I'm walking down the hallway, I can hear this noise. And I thought, <laughs> what the, someone's got their TV on or something. I knocked on the door, I opened the door. Well, God, my God. <laughs> but what happened was, there's a backstory to this. And I don't even know if Brad knows this. So we had a player playing for us called Chris Mortimer. And Chris Mortimer was the senior player in the club. And Chris Mortimer told me the story that back in 1980, when they won the comp with the Bulldogs. He was a very, very young player. And the last training session before they went to that grand final, um, the senior players thought the younger players were a bit nervous. So they took, them a beer, they took them for a beer a couple of nights out from the game just to settle the nerves, you know. So Chris was our senior player. And we had a lot of blokes playing in their first ever game. They were all kids, you know. We're staying in the region hotel. And Chris Mortimer was the one who decided he got this thoughts back to 1980 with the Bulldogs. Maybe we need a beer just to, <laughs> just to settle the nerve. Not plural. <laughs> hey. Well, I don't know how champagne gets into beers. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so they, they had a bit of a night out. So I didn't count who was in the room. The next morning I just got... I went down the hallway and Roy Simmons is in his bed with pillows alongside him <laughs> so he doesn't fall out of bed. He's playing in his first ever grand final. And I sat on the bed. I said, can you believe them blokes are having a drink down there? He wanted to go down and kill them. <laughs> So the next morning I got up and I said, listen, I don't know, I didn't count who was in the room, I didn't look, I don't, I don't care, but whoever's in that room, you beat yourselves out to Penrith Park this afternoon, punch the bags and, you know, have a bit of a sweat out before we train in the morning, you know. So I drove past Penrith Park that night and every car was in the car park, so <laughs> they, they, were, they were all in the room. But it, it, it was great. It didn't cost us the game. It, the thing that I thought hurt us on the day was the fact that um, the game before us went to extra time. Remember that? They held the kickoff up for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think Canberra handled that better. They led us 12 nil. We only got beat 18 14. I think that was the, the, turn, the, the hard part for us on the day. But yeah, Chris Mortimer said, Coach, he said, I, I thought we were nervous. We needed a drink. I said, <laughs> OK, I can understand that. Getting, getting back to Origin, I don't think no one did Origin as a coach better than you. And every camp, there was a theme. You'd have a theme. Mm. How much. Um, preparation in your own head did you have to not only talk about a theme but then peak the players for Wednesday night that they were ready to go to war? Yeah, that's... Um, I, my thoughts with Origin was that I wanted to make it real special. I wanted to make it a different sort of football and a different sort of environment. When I came in in 1992, New South Wales hadn't had a great record but... We were sort of the first team that went into seven and eight day camps and I wanted to make the camp special and fill in the time and you bring players together from different clubs who compete with each other on a, on a weekly basis and probably don't see a lot of each other back in those days and you bring them in to, get a, uh, to fight for a common cause and a common theme and you know, the, the themes would be around the football or be around the motivation mm. or around your families and all those sorts of things and it might tie into our game plan or the things that were important into our game plan but it was kind of like... I wanted everything to flow during the point of the week where by the time we got to game day, there was one single thought going through our minds that, you know, if we just do this, the rest will just come and trust your talent and trust everything from there. And, um, you know, I did put a lot of time and a lot of thought into it, but uh, when you're dealing with the elite talent that Origin presents you, when you beat, you've got the best players available to you, you can achieve so much in a week, in, in the space of a week. And the important part was the togetherness. The important part was playing for each other. The football was the easy part to coach with those sorts of players. We could achieve more in a week than you would do with a club side in the whole off-season, mm. tactically or strategically. We get the basics right, we get the strategy right, but the rest of it was how do we battle this Queensland spirit or how do we keep getting up when we hurt? How do we keep running when we're tired? How do we understand how exhausting is this going to be? How do we fight right to the last play every time we play? 
and understand the nuances of origin football and where it's won and where it's lost. It's, it's rarely lost on just pure football. Um, there are other things that, that beat you. And uh, it was trying to get the players to a new level of concentration or a new level of toughness or a new level of you know, pushing themselves to extraordinary extremes. Um, because it's, that's what origin football is. It's the best of the best. And you're dealing with the best players. The coaching part of it's actually easy. It's, it's getting ready for the enormity of the, of the occasion and what it means and what meaning means in that environment. You brought Freddie back for that. And you two have a father and son-like relationship. What did that mean when Freddie scored that try? Oh, it's incredible. You know, like that, that's, again, that had a backstory because Brad had his last game back in 2000, 2001, 2001, mm. 2001 and that was when they brought Alfie mm. back from, and it sort of spoiled, he, mm. he was going to retire from rep football at that time and not that it was ever planned whatsoever. Um, Nick talked me into coaching the Origin in 2002 and I didn't think about it, but in the back of my mind I thought if there's ever one game where we could get him back and get the finale right um, and... In 2004, we had a horror run with injuries in our halves. And it was even game two. It wasn't even the game three, the decider. It was game two. I kind of dialed his number uh, to ask what he thought. And he answered the phone. He said, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> he, he didn't even wait for the question. He knew. He didn't even wait for the question. He said, yeah, I'm in. Well, I was at home. And then what had happened? We just got beat by Canterbury. And so it was a close game. We had, in that period, our... Canterbury and the Roosters, mate, the games were epic. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. And Willie Tonga actually scored three or four tries down the left-hand side. Anyway, so I woke up in the morning and Gus said, basically, yeah, you would come play, so I'll play. And so well, I remember I lived on the beach. I went for a walk along the beach. I'm getting in my own head ready for it. And I get this call from Sticky. <laughs> he goes, what the... <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> I said, mate, I'm playing Origin. <laughs> he goes, you're not at the moment. Get to training. I went, oh... Serious. So anyway, I went to training. And got flogged. Flogged. Literally, like, the Wenny Park stairs were just up and down and oh. rowing machines. Got hammered. Oh. So I've come into camp and, mate, I was crook for most of the week. Like, Man. just, yeah, I just, I got crook, like, a oh. bit of a flu. So well, that was game two. That was the, the Billy Slater try one, yeah. wasn't it? Up in, up at Lang Park. We, we actually, we had actually had we we lost had that him. game. But we lost two halfbacks that week. I mean, um, Matt Orford and Brett Camorley both got injured. Oh, Finchie played Finchie, yeah. Brett Finch came in in the last couple of days and played halfback. And we lost. And so it wasn't the great comeback no. that, I, that we sort of wanted. And I just went to him straight after the game. I said, what do you think? He said, no, we'll end it in Sydney. He said, we'll go to Sydney and get him, get him right. So and that was the decider? That was the decider. That was the, that was the last one. And what, what, did, what did you just beat him by? No. Uh, oh. 30-odd. Yeah, yeah. We did well. Yeah, we had a good side. Jizzle was a good, a good young team. I remember scoring that try turnaround. around. There was Gaznia, Willie, mm. uh, Cooper, Ogre. Heine, was Ogre Fitzy, there? Ogre. Ogre played in the series. Mate, they were just Fair young. Nice, they were ben, good. Kennedy, ben Kennedy played uh, that Trent game? Barrett was I half-back, I'm pretty I sure. I think BK. Well, maybe. I think BK, yeah, BK was, was there. Yeah. I think BK. BK hadn't played for 10 weeks and I put him in. Mm. I think he only came in for game three. Okay. Yeah, BK played. Yeah. It was BK, Fitzy. Yeah. Uh, Bedsy played? Bedsy played. Bedsy yeah. was the Bedsy captain. Oh, that's right. Bedsy tells all the party boys. Yeah. They were all there. Before I let you go, there are some bits of vision that you just can't help but laugh at. This is one of them. Seeds. Laurie's <laughs> <laughs> got no idea what to do. He's just too polite. <laughs> He's too good a bloke, isn't he? Oh, he's, just, he's, he's just too poor. He's too those, good a bloke. See those blokes behind? They're, they're the we ran into those on the bonding night. They're the army blokes. Yeah, they're the army. And they blokes just right. thought oh. they just thought we're bush footy players. <laughs> Next thing we get him into camp, they get to the ground. They're just well, like, back, back what in, is this guy? It, Laurie, Laurie was my assistant. Cal, Laurie was our captain when we in the early nineties yeah. when I first started. You know, and I was there for five years, and Laurie was our captain. And um, and I used to talk a lot about the US Marines, didn't I? I used to talk mm. about, you know, and relate to sort of those types of things and their code and their w and wars and all that sort of thing. So here we are. We've got a... Um, I think this was a decider too. And... and Oh, no, it's game two. We wrapped it up in game two. Yeah. We, yeah, but anyway... There's a bloke over your shoulder there. Yeah, yeah. So they're, three of them. They're US, yeah, right. Marine. they're, they're US Marines. Right. So we... I used to take the staff out, you know, a couple of nights a week for a bit of a dinner. I'd send the boys home and we'd go out and have a Chinese meal and a night out. 
We went to the Sydney Casino this night, and Laurie's come running from the far end of the casino. He said, Gus, Gus, he said, I've, I've just run into four US Marines. I said, what are you talking about? He said, US Marines, real US Marines. I said, what do you mean? He said, they're on their way back from Kuwait or somewhere. Right. So we went over and met them. There was the general and the yeah. officer and this. And they came and we talked to them, you know. So we talked them into coming in the next night to talk to the players. And they came in and they gave us extraordinary, extraordinary mm. lectures about being a US Marine, their mm. code, you know, wow. what they'd been through. They'd just been uh, in, on active duty in the I, Middle East. I, I can remember when they, when they were talking about when the knock on the door came. They had to the, when yeah, you knock yeah. on the door and you're from a small country town and you had to go. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's for, this is the thing. Gus is talking about that <laughs> and then two minutes before the game, the <laughs> touch judge hits the door and he goes, righto, there's your knock on your door. I'm getting goosebumps. Get out there. Yeah. yeah. But the, you, the, uh, the, so the US, we, we invited them to the game. No one knew who they were. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. But they, they'd been act, in active service every They were blown weeks. away by yeah. it, yeah. weren't they? Yeah. they were... But their stories were great. Oh, yeah. They thought that they didn't know what we were. They didn't know if we were a pub team or not. Yeah, yeah. they had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they turned up and there was 80,000 at AFC <laughs> Stadium. And they've got ringside seats. They're sitting down on the tickets with us. Oh, yeah. my wow. God, you guys don't wear helmets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Gus, thanks for... Uh... Oh, Penrith to win. You're tipping Penrith? Yes, Panthers yeah. win. Yes. Thanks for coming in. Have you ever watched this show, by the way? No. No, I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> like it. everyone else. We'll see you on the weekend. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be This Is Your Life. Yeah. Where's Mike Munro? Does he still work? <laughs> um, see you on the weekend. Thank you. It's Phil Gould's joining us. It's a massive day, of course, right throughout the day. Here on Nine, exclusively live and free. Prepare for the greatest grand final of our time. Two giants. Oh, there's another spectacular one. Playing footy oh. like no one else can. Right footy from the Melbourne Storm. Ruthless. Here come Penrith again. Relentless. Can they make it four titles in a row? And ready to let rip. Wow! What a finish we've got coming up here. Sunday, the best teams on the planet. Oh. In the biggest battle of all. The grand final, let's go. Fuzzy superstar, the Kid Leroy, rocks the NRL grand final. What a blockbuster. Storm Panthers, exclusive live and free. Sunday, 6.30 on 9 and 9 now. Carol, how are you doing on top of him again? One of the greatest grand finals ever. When you put them all together, that one's right up there on the list. NRLW grand final Sunday as well. Fascinating clash, this one. Last time they met these teams, it was 40-0 to them. the Roosters, but the Sharks until that point hadn't been beaten. Yep. I called the Roosters game against the Knights on the weekend. Roosters are red hot. They'll be winning this one. That's so. the best I've ever seen the Roosters play. Jeez, they were good. You know it was good? Sam Bremner. Sam Bremner. She killed it. She only came back because they had an injury. Yeah. yeah. Start of the year. One week Couldn't out from the competition. <laughs> no, you should have seen a couple of tries. She's running, you know, those Johnny lines yeah, used yeah. to run. Hertz used to run straight through. They did that a couple of times. That yeah. Day. Stummy cross and then she comes mm. in between. Just remember, Sharky's held Brisbane to nil. They haven't been held to nil ever until it, the weekend. This will be the most physical game. Yeah. Like the Shark centres. You got Penatani and I'm trying to think who the other centre is. Um, Isabel Kelly. No, 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 the shark the, the, centre. Oh, um, Biddle. Biddle. Oh, Isabel She's Kelly. an absolute she weapon. She dislocated her elbow a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. That was Kelly and she played. It was two weeks ago and she played straight away. Yes, it'll be a, a massive game. Of course, the state championship final, that kicks off all the live action. I've got to say, boys, we need a lift from the Queensland team. The last time they won was 2015. That was Ipswich. That was a long time That's ago. That's right. They had a different style of play under the Walker, yep. the Walker brothers, Sam Walker's father and Shane. So there's been, um, there's been a few big scores in there too to the New South Wales Cup champ. So let's hope that we, we can level things up. They're playing the mighty Newtown Jets. Yeah. It's a great initiative. I love it. Really love it, this interstate 
championship competition. But there it is. Look at that. There it oh. is. Oh, what a ball. What a run. Made famous by Adam Muir, that, that play. He used to run that line so well. Yeah. Do you know where that play was found by Malcolm Rooley? In the World Cup semi when we played <coughs> Kiwis. Yeah, right. You put brush in. Yeah. So Malcolm Rooley was watching in the crowd. He saw that and that was just off the cuff mm. and he came back and implemented it in our off-season. Go and watch it. I think Brash scored off you. Yeah, it would have been. He came across and went like that and then all of a sudden you went to pass and Brash just appeared. Anyway, go look at that on YouTube. All right, Freddie, what do you got for us here? What have you pinpointed from Penrith that will be critical on Sunday? Something that we've seen, this is Melbourne. Andrew, you want to go through Melbourne's? Uh, well, this is the one. They'll be attacking the gap between... Garner and Luai. So this is Pappenhausen. Just watch the variations they do on their right side. Once again, the targets are here between Angus and Kiri. Once again, done at speed. Manipulating the defensive line in between where Garner and Luai will be defending. I have no doubt that'll be a target again. And then once again, a little set play to hold defenders and Jerome Hughes. Straight between the half and the back rower, between Luai and Garner. So here's the 40-20, but what they do after the 40-20, um, we used to do a play in the old days actually called BK, where you have a ball player and you have two runners that buddy up. If you have a look at here, you've got Alamonte and is that Garner? Yep. I think that's Garner. And what they do is they double up on one defender and you have someone come around the back. And they did this a couple of times. They do it for kicks, they do it for passes. And they do it on both sides of the field as well. But this has been one of the big changes to the way they play the Panthers. Here you go. Jerome calls it out. You've got oh. the fullback at the back. You've got the, the BK, the two blokes. They're lining up on the one defender. And this is always the option, the kick. What happens with the BK is, of course, you've got two blokes. The outside defence have to come up and they have to come forward. So the kick ends up being a great option. All right. There's a, a great insight from the boys. What did you make of the prelims? Oh. A lot of people have said Penrith, not as impressive, but just consider for a moment, the conditions were vastly conditions. different. The conditions were different. Melbourne were a nine out of half, nine, nine and a half out of ten. I, I, I thought Penrith were probably a seven and a half or an eight, but the conditions were so slippery. Mm. If it was dry, they, they would have put a real score on. And I feel like Penrith emotionally... Boarded on maybe because you know, the game got close. The game got to 20 minutes to go, it got to 10 6. And it stuck there for a while, didn't it? And I thought what they did oh no, they scored straight away, Penrith. So they scored. Pardon me, it, it was it was at 10 0? It was 10 0 for quite a while. 10 2 for a long time. Yeah. And then got to 10 6. Yeah. And then they jumped straight away. They scored straight after it. But I thought what they did was I thought they were doing what they had to do. I don't think they really stretched themselves much mm. further than that. The conditions had a lot to do with that. And I think they just backed. Uh, their ability to concentrate, and you just saw actually the last 20 minutes of Sharks, the amount of errors they come up with. Ball. Yeah. When that scoreboard starts playing with your head, mm. and the time's ticking over, and you're a try behind, it makes you do funny things. So breaking down Penrith's defence has been almost impossible in the last three years, but Melbourne score tries from their own half of the field, don't they? they but they can the attack from everywhere. They use the ball, and. When they, the difference between Melbourne and other clubs, when they do their plays, they're at speed. But then also they can do their plays, but then they go into ad-lib footy with Munster. Harry Green gets out of them. When Harry gets out, they don't miss. They're all pushing up. Mm. But that's the thing. They do their set plays. They don't at speed. They know who they're going at. Um, but when they go into ad-lib, they've they got the best ad-lib plays in the comp. The one where they miss Nelson is competing for kicks. Will Warbrick. Mm. competing for kicks. Without Nelson, you don't get as far up the field. Mm. A lot of their good stuff's off the back of one of his big runs. He drags so many defenders in. A lot of the stuff's done off that. And then, therefore, you're further down the field. And Will Warbrick's been lethal. He'll be up against Taruva. Now, he'll get over him quite easily. It's just a matter of if they can get far enough down the field. No one's done that. No one's you, isolated the wingers. Well, Penrith is so scored, good at can, keeping you down your end. They can set a 12 tries off kicks all year. Unbelievable. And you've got the two smallest wingers. Mm. I was kicking... For Melbourne, if if they got down there, I'd be working the play right to the opposite sideline because when you get the sideline, the gaps out here are yeah. bigger and mm. then just whoosh, big 40-metre one, 
Warbrick. They do that well, very... Xavier, Xavier Coates. Well, that's what... And discipline's going to be the big thing. Like, actually, well, you look referee... at the way in Melbourne, he gave penalties. He gave three penalties in the first two mm. minutes against Melbourne, and the Roosters scored straight away, and then... Turn it around down the other end, five minutes later, he went six again, six again, six again. Mm. And Melbourne scored. While Klein actually was a bit more reserved. I hope there's no drama in the first tackle. It's been happening a bit. Well, you know what? It's happened recently a bit. But outside Anzac Day, I can only remember it three times this year. But it happened in the... But it's happened, it's happened in the last few weeks. It happened in the last two weeks. But it's only three times. But it's three really times. charged up. It's the games when everyone's pumped up. Of course they are. Who's got them wrong? Yeah. Too many people coming into the, each other's space, mm. trying to make an impact. I don't like it when people invade your personal space. Uh, amazing to think that Melbourne last team to beat Penrith in 2020, and they could bookend this period of grand final dominance by the Panthers. Oh. I think they're going to be so hard. What about their wings? Josh Adokar and Suni Vunavalu. Mm. What a contrast! This was a big play. Yeah, off the scrum. I reckon that's the spot they'll attack. Nathan side? Oh, he's got that right hand. I don't think Tungle's been... I think he's been better. I think if Tungle's defence is good, I can't see Melbourne. Oh, what a kick. <laughs> Once again, well, Melbourne around. jumped out to a massive lead here, remember? Yeah. That was 20 odd, wasn't it 20 nil at half time? 24 nil or something, yeah. Now oh, they did come charging back, Penrith. All but four of their team have uh, played in grand finals, as and you'd you, expect. Given and I reckon the I think it's only four or five of Melbourne's players that have played in grand oh, finals. It's a totally new team, isn't it? Mm. That's a big number. Who knew Is he still Jesus. in rugby? I don't know. He was an athlete. Have a look at that. Whoa. Yeah, wasn't he? Feels like a lot has changed since. Since that game back in 2020, that was COVID, of course. The stadium was half full. But it was actually that game that proved the catalyst for Penrith to go and be so dominant over the last few years. Mm. What do you think? I like the Storm. I think they're healthier. And um, I just think it's their time. I think they can get them on the edges, as I sp spoke about there. They get their good, don't they? Jeez, they get their tactics They do their on. set plays better than anyone. They get their Lightning tactics quick. on so well. Penrith for you? Penrith. Yeah. What about Lockie? I think... Uh, Melbourne by 12. I think... I, I do think Nelson's going to be a big loss. Mm. They're starting with Tui now. Yeah. I think, oh, he, and I think Lazarus, he'll be a big loss. Young guy, Lazarus. Pardon me. Lazarus Vilepu comes onto the bench. He's played six first grade games. Mm. Um, and I reckon in a couple of them, he didn't get on the field. <laughs> so... Well. He's, he's got the vastly biggest, experience. He's got the biggest legs in the competition. Lazarus. Oh, right dear Sam. It's a great name. Boys, thank you very much for another great year. Very enjoyable. Great to have Uncle Gus with thank us on you. the couch today thank as well. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, uh, enjoy Sunday. Look forward to seeing you out there. And thanks to everyone for watching. We have a we've special a guest today too. Oh, before we go, we we, have we, a yes, we've got to bring another star member of our team here at Freddie and the Eighth, introducing a little bit of class. A little late. <laughs> so, hello. Look here. Speak in the microphone. Hi. Very good. What song do we sing in the car today? Guns and Roses. <laughs> Guns and Roses. <laughs> what song? I'm on the. I'm on the night train. I'm on the night train. <laughs> Very good. What's Dad doing looking after you this week? Well, it's school oh, holidays, nice. isn't it? Ah. We went to the tippy pool this morning. Had fun. We're going to go surfing now. You been to the Chloe? Maybe tonight. Has <laughs> the Chloe put on a good feed? <laughs> What's Daddy do at the Chloe? Uh, drink beers. <laughs> <laughs> good on you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Enjoy the grand final. This year, NRL on 9 is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast. Get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And, of course, my favourite, Fred in the Oak. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.